I'm particularly obsessed, I guess, with with British jazz, uh, and in particular, my personal hero, the, uh, the the amazing, the incredible Mr. Joe Harriet. Uh, Joe, West Indian born, Kingston, Jamaica, went to the Alpha Boys School, which was like an orphanage, um, a Catholic school run by nuns and he uh, learnt to play there it's it's well known for music a lot of the scar to light and um, uh, a lot of big Jamaican musicians from the 60s attended Al the Alpha Boy School at the same time as Joe strangely enough um, he, he moved to the UK in 1951 he was touring and he jumped ship I think and uh, stopped in London uh, where he lived and uh, for the remainder of his life until he died in January the second, nineteen seventy-three. Too young, untimely death, lung cancer. Um, he, I don't think it's I don't think it's unreasonable to state that that Joe pretty much invented modern British jazz. Um, in fact, he didn't pretty much invent modern British jazz. He's almost entirely responsible for modern British jazz. It didn't exist before Joe. In the 1950s, British jazz was, was simply a, a shadow of American jazz. It was it, Everyone was obsessed with authenticity and trying to replicate the American sound. Um, Joe was the first guy in this country who decided that there wasn't a need to replicate American jazz, that, it, it, that he had something other to say he wasn't he wasn't interested in in following the jazz route uh he had been for 10 years i mean when he first came to the uk he was very well known for his ability to sound just like charlie parker who was his hero but by 1961 um well we'll get to that in a minute by 1961 he'd changed tack completely he uh he was creating european free jazz. He was the creator of European free jazz, British free jazz. And his style of free jazz was completely different to Ornette Coleman, who was his contemporary. And certainly in this country, he was constantly compared to Coleman. And yet they're, they're very different players. They had a very, very different concept of, of what free jazz meant. And um, I'm going to do a few of these videos because this is pretty long winded and complicated. So I thought this video would just entail looking at some of his some of his albums that you're probably not familiar with, uh, but that you should be familiar with. So let's start with uh, his first free jazz album, um, which was all of his output was produced by a guy called Dennis Preston, who uh, in British jazz circles is well known. He's the, he's the Sven Gali of British jazz from the 50s and 60s. He had huge hits as a producer in the 50s here. Um, he discovered Joe Meek, who you may well have heard of, who was a kind of legendary British pop engineer. And um, Joe Meek worked for Dennis Preston for about four or five years during the tail end of the 50s. And then they fell out because I think they were both quite uh, large personalities. Um, and they, uh, they both wanted to be the boss. But of course, Dennis was the boss. Joe wasn't. Anyway, We'll talk about Dennis a bit more later as well. So, all of these albums were produced by Dennis. What Dennis's input was into these records isn't entirely clear, although I think uh, my research has uncovered quite a lot of interesting, interesting data about what his input may have been and what his cousin's input may have been. But we'll talk more about that later as well. So, first of all, let's have a look at it, some of these albums. So the first free jazz album by Joe Harriet um, uh, is this. Freeform, the Joe Harriet Quintet. So the lineup changed a tiny bit over over the sort of three or four years that this band were in existence, but but not much. Uh, certainly the recorded lineup, uh, only the, the 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 drummer changed. Um, originally it was the, the the legendary British jazz drummer Phil Seaman, um, and uh, he was later replaced by uh, a guy called Bobby Orr, who was another terrific jazz drummer. Um, Phil was notorious. <laughs> for his uh, heroin habit, 
Uh, he was also notorious for being pretty outspoken, and he's probably most well known outside the UK for having been the guy who taught Ginger Baker. If you ever hear Phil Seaman talking, it's uncannily like Ginger Baker, almost like Ginger Baker modelled his entire personality and playing style on Phil. Very bizarre. So anyway, free form. So the lineup on this album is uh, Joe Harriet, alto sax, and he composed all the pieces as well. Shake Keen, uh, fellow uh, West Indian. Trumpeter and flugelhorn, amazing player, amazing front line, those two. Um, telepathic, uh, like you wouldn't believe, really. Um, Coleridge Good on bass, another West Indian. So it was, there was three West Indian guys. Uh, um, a pianist called Pat Smythe, who was uh, Scottish, and, and Phil Seaman, and then later Bobby Orr. But on this album, it's just Phil Seaman. Uh, and... Uh, the, it's important to understand that in 1961, when this album was recorded, well, actually, it was actually recorded in 1960, but it didn't get released until 1961. It was recorded at the end of 1960. Um, when it was recorded, this quintet were, were, were undoubtedly the finest players in the UK. Um, and a lot of people have talked about why Joe wasn't more influential. Um... I'd probably argue that he was, uh, but later. And most of the reason I think that he, was, he wasn't as influential early on at the time was simply because in the UK there wasn't anybody else who could, who could recreate this music. There wasn't anybody else who could do it. There wasn't anybody else who could take up the mantle. Um, we, the, the, the standard of players didn't really reach those kind of heights that Joe and Shake and all those other guys in the in the quintet uh, were already, the level they were already at. Uh, other players in the UK didn't really reach that level until sort of 63, 64, where you started to see other guys emerging. You might Westbrooks and um, other individuals like that, John Stevens. Um, but in 1960, when this was recorded, there was literally nobody else uh, in these guys' league. Uh, and Joe's form of free jazz is unique. It's an, it's an interesting combination. It's a combination of the two types of music, that, the two types of jazz that were really popular at the time in the UK, bebop, modern jazz, and trad jazz. Um, and the way that he worked his concept is that it's not a free-for-all, uh, as you might expected to be like say like Ornette Coleman particularly like uh, free jazz Ornette Coleman album free jazz which really is almost like a free for, a complete free for all you know every man for himself and I'll see you at the other end kind of thing this is entirely different it's actually quite surprising when you listen to this that he was compared to Ornette Coleman so often because it doesn't sound anything like Coleman Harriet's playing is nothing like Coleman at all he was a he was a virtuoso you know technique guy unlike Coleman and he was schooled in every type of music. Joe had played everything that was going. He was actually in the very first UK R&B band in about 1954. Um, he played bebop predominantly during the 50s, but also he played a bit of trad um, and yeah, R&B. Uh, he was a big hard bop fan and he was a very close friend of Horace Silver's. Horace Silver actually wrote a few songs for him later in his career. Um, but yeah, Joe's style of free-form jazz, as I said, it's kind of a combination between trad and um, bebop. And the way that that works is that, um, it, it, in the sense that if you listen to the New Orleans jazz, there's very much a kind of a intertwining of players, soloists soloing at the same time, but, they're, it, but it's almost like conversational soloing as opposed to just um, going for it. Uh, it, it, it it's... You could almost describe it as social freeform jazz, or maybe even communist freeform jazz, and I'll get to that a bit later in a in another video. Um, go and listen to it, and you'll see exactly what I mean. It, it's it, it's ex extraordinary. It, it must have taken them a long time to actually get it up to the stand that that, that it is on this even on this record, the first one. So, yeah. This probably the most seminal because it's the first, you know. 
might not be the best of the, uh, he did three of these kind of albums it may, it may not be the strongest um of the three but they're all incredible incidentally but it's a it's, it's a fantastic standalone album play that way. so the second album that he did in this series and that's which is half phil seaman uh, and half bobby orr is this abstract uh, this is the first British jazz album ever to receive a five-star star review from Downbeat magazine in the US. Um, Harvey Pecker, I think. Um, and it, yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit freer. Um, here we still have a little bit of kind of programming in terms of the way that the soloists are interacting with one another. But here now, by this point... It really is just this beautiful kind of interwoven, free, um, conversational jazz. There's actually a, a Sonny Rollins cover on here, which is a uh, a beautiful reworking of Olio, which is uh, well worth hearing. Just on its own, this is probably the strongest of the three albums. It is magnificent. There's no two ways about it. Uh, Original copies of this, I, this one was issued in the US. I'm not sure whether this was issued in the US. It was issued on Jazzland in, in the UK, and it may have been issued on Jazzland in the US as well. Um, this, I think, was released on Columbia in the US, maybe? Um, or Capital. I think it was actually Capital. Um, and you can pick up um, copies of this pretty cheaply, especially American copies. I think that um, there were quite a lot shipped out to the US. British copies are much harder to find quite expensive if you can get hold of one but us copies you can pick up for kind of like 25 30 dollars and you should because <laughs> it's that good um revolutionary contemporary jazz by london's most exciting combo it certainly is and we've got the kind of you know that the abstract art references a bit like the the coleman stuff and and perhaps the reason why he was compared to coleman so much in the uk was down to marketing rather than the music itself well, maybe perhaps you could blame Preston for that a little bit because he probably chose the front cover. But yeah, it's a it's a must-have this album. The third album I don't have. I do, but I've only got it on the CD, so we won't go into we, we won't get we won't dig one that one out. But it's uh, it's called Movement. Um, if you can find a copy, good luck. Um, it was never released in the US. It was only released in the UK, I believe. And I've got friends who are record collectors and record sellers and buyers who've never even seen the original copy of movement that i think that the uh the pop psych price is about 800 pounds but it's probably unrealistic because they never come up so there's probably two or three years since the last copy actually appeared god only knows what it would be worth now i mean it's uh you know the kind of um the kind of uh what's the word i'm looking for here the standard for kind of the expensive British jazz is is, is um, yeah, the Ian Carr and Don Rendell's um, Shades of Blue, which can fetch crazy money, three grand. But movement's probably not far off that if one actually ever shows up, maybe even more. And it's the freest. It's it's uh, it's inspired by people like Colin Cardew and Anton Weber, and you know his his his. Um, his music looms large in 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 movement. Uh, Harriet was very influenced by avant-garde classical composers at the time, and it really is a, a record which is truly unique. And it probably scared the label so much that they actually forced him to uh, do some kind of standard jazz stuff. <laughs> so it's a strange mixture of kind of um, post-hard bop compositions and this stunning uh, free. I don't even know if you can call it jazz. It's improvisation. I don't know if it's jazz. There's no swing or, you know, blue notes or... Um, it's just free improvisation and it's incredible. I don't think anybody's ever done anything quite like that record. Um, there's, there's a live EP which was released recently by... Um, I'm trying to remember who it's by. Oh, it's by Gearbox, that's right. It was a BBC session from around about that time, 62, 63, um, which unfortunately doesn't feature any of the, the tracks from, from Movement. But it does feature some of the tracks from Abstract, and it's more or less the only live um, documentation of, of, of the band in that period. And it's 
incredible. But <laughs> even though it's only about 22 minutes long, get it if you can find it. It's not very expensive and it's beautiful. And there's a couple of Dizzy Reese tracks on here because Harriet and Dizzy Reese were good friends and they they actually played together a little bit in the late 50s and early 60s. So Dizzy Reese was another um, West Indian emigre who en I think he ended up in New York actually. Um, from there, after his kind of trilogy of free jazz albums, um, he then moved on to make one of the first ever world records, world music records, uh, which I showed you right at the very start, Indo Jazz Suite with John Mayer, who's an Indian sitarist, violinist, uh, composer, very talented guy. This is a, another kind of watershed moment. This is an incredible record. 60, 65 or 66? I can never remember. Hey, I'm doing a thesis on this. I should be able to remember. 66 it is, 66. So it's you know it, it it's it's right in the middle when the Beatles are experimenting with this kind of stuff as well and it's it's um it's uh it's an incredible suite it's all written by John Mayer and it's a double quintet so it's it's Joe's quintet with again with um, Coleridge Good and um, Pat Smythe and I can't remember whether Shakes on here or whether it's somebody else Eddie Blair. Okay, and then Rick Laird, of course, on bass, who, of course, ended up uh, in Mahavishnu Orchestra. So this is a pretty kind of seminal record. That's quite incredible, actually. Um, I'd forgotten all about that. These, I mean, this is a, this is an original mono press. You can pick these up. I think they were, this was on Atlantic in the US, and I think you can probably pick up Atlant copies of it in America on Atlantic fairly cheaply. But... Uh, yeah, another must-have. Um, he did three of these. I don't have the middle one on vinyl. I've got that on CD, so I'll leave that aside. The third one is uh, Indo Jazz Fusions 2. So it was Indo Jazz Suite, and then Indo Jazz Fusions, and then Indo Jazz Fusions 2. They're all wonderful. Uh, they're all kind of must-haves, in my opinion. <laughs> but I might be slightly biased. Finally, two more for you. One of them's not a Joe Harriet record at all. This one, Humdono, Joe Harriet, Amancio de Silva Quartet, uh, original, this is a repress, uh, it's a Vocalion repress from um, a couple of years back, mine signed by Dave Green, the lovely, wonderful Dave Green, um, who plays bass on this record, and uh, whose son's a mate of mine actually, funny, by some strange coincidence, uh, Brian Spring on drums, Amancio de Silva on guitar, Norman Winston, uh, Ian Carr's on this album as well. Uh, another another magnificent album. Original copies of this. Again, you know, well over a grand. Maybe two grand. I don't know. Um, but you can pick up a reissue for like twenty quid, and it's 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 an, it's an amazing album. So uh, again, another Dennis Preston production. They were all Dennis Preston, Preston productions that Joe did, except for one album right at the end of Joe's career, which wasn't produced by Dennis Preston. And I don't have it on vinyl, so I'm not going to show it here. But, so finally, I just wanted to show you this. This is actually the last thing he ever appeared on. This has... He only plays a, a, a little bit. He's not on this album very much, but there is one truly, truly stunning and beautiful solo uh, on track one, Prelude. And this has got an outrageous lineup as well. Stan, Stan Tracy... Uh, Joe Harriet, Tony Coe, Tubby Hayes, uh, Ray Ray Premru. Yeah, it's 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 pretty uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, it's a really beautiful record. You can pick these up for relatively cheap, maybe twenty pounds. You might have to pay a bit more if you're in the US. I don't think it was ever released in the US, which is a shame. Um, and it's it's a it's a a jazz symphony, if you like. Um, in fact, it actually says on it. Music, music for Combined Jazz and Symphony Orchestra with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, and there's good old Laurie. He did, Laurie wrote a lot of uh, kind of TV themes in the 70s, which are quite famous, certainly in the UK. Although, I'm scratching my head to remember which ones he did. But he, uh, he he's probably better known as a kind of a TV theme composer than he is as a jazz composer, even though this is a really fabulous jazz, orchestral jazz record. Um... Very unique, not like American jazz at all. None of these are, in fact. And so there we are. I thought I would just uh, give you a little introduction to my passion, and I'll, I'll, I'll we'll talk about it a bit more about what I've what I've discovered. <laughs>
uh, in my research for my thesis in, in, in another video soon. Stay safe, stay well, listen to Joe Harriet. <laughs>